Professor of Performance and Pedagogy here at the University of Southern Mississippi. I'm really excited to present this topic to you. It's uh, something that I care an awful lot about. It's a piece of music by a composer named Yana Zanakis entitled Safa for solo percussion. Um, a few things about the piece. Um, first of all, I'll talk about Yana Zanakis. Um, Zanakis was born uh, in 1922 in Brelia, Romania to Greek parents. Uh, he subsequently moved from there to Cyprus and was educated um, on the island there at private school. Ultimately earned his um, engineering degree from the Athens Polytechnic University in Athens, Greece. Around the same time, this was right around World War II, around the same time um, after being occupied by the Nazis, then the fascist Italian government, uh, the British ultimately took control in the post-war era. And um, Zanakis was involved in student protests uh, and the reason I bring this up is because in those protests, there were, uh, you know, battles basically on the street, and um, he was injured. He lost half his face in an explosion that happened during one of these. He's part of the Communist Party, and the British weren't too keen on communists. So uh, he ultimately was, once he was able to recuperate from his injuries, he uh, was forced to leave Greece because it was a worn out for his arrest. Uh, and so he left and went to Paris, where he spent the remainder of his life. Uh, in exile for most of that time. He, um, as I said, lost half of his face. Um, a lot of his pieces, the writing that he does is very uh, evocative of war. Um, loud, dissonant music, um, but also uh, sort of the, the stark silences in between the explosions and that anticipation that builds. Um, while in Paris, he worked for the architect uh, Le Corbusier, his engineering background that he had uh, served him well in architecture. Uh, he was a, very much into mathematics and um, a branch called stochastics, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. In his spare time, um, he studied music composition with Darius Mio and then eventually transferred and studied with um, Oliver Messiaen. And during that time, he really found a mentor in Messiaen who uh, encouraged him to write in a language that he understood. His early works, he really focused on sort of like Greek melodies and these kind of ancient sounding music. But ultimately, uh, studying with Messiaen, he moved on to writing music that was based on these mathematical processes that he studied. Uh, his first sort of, oh, I'm just realizing the PowerPoint is not on the screen. Let me remedy that for you. The first champion of his works that he had uh, was a man by the name of Hermann Sershin, who was a conductor. And uh, Sershin really encouraged Zanakis to not only take these incredible scores that he had written that were uh, very much like uh, graphs and lines and uh, more pictorial than they were actually scores, and he encouraged him to put those into more traditional notation. And uh, that's another theme that's going to kind of come back throughout this lecture as well. He wrote nearly, I don't know, uh, probably about 200 compositions over the course of his lifetime. And of these, 20 exclusively or prominently feature percussion, uh, chamber pieces, concert pieces, orchestral pieces, but also his solo percussion works. He wrote two, uh, Safa and Rebounds. He also wrote two percussion ensemble pieces for percussion sextet, and then finally, um, he wrote a djembe trio. And actually I say finally, but his last piece was a concerto, um, a short concerto written for the percussionist Evelyn Glenny, uh, entitled Omega, which is interesting because it was his last piece and he titles it the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Um, and it was nearly three or four years before he passed away. So um, he had definitely given up composition by that point. The title Safa, refers to the poet Sappho, who was an archaic, ancient uh, poet in Greece, and she is credited with being the first to introduce iambic meter into her poems. And anybody who's suffered through an English class where you have to pick apart a uh, Shakespearean sonnet, you'll know that that's based on something called iambic pentameter. Um, that word iambic has to do with these stresses of short and long, or uh, stressed sound followed by or an unstressed sound followed by a stressed sound. Or in music, we call that an accented sound or an unaccented sound. So Zanakis was fascinated by this concept, and not that the piece is based on any one of these poems, but he's just, it's kind of an homage, it's kind of a tribute to her. 
Uh, it was written for the percussionist Sylvia Gualda, who was the percussionist for the Paris Opera, as well as uh, taught at the Paris Conservatory. He was a big champion of contemporary music in the late 60s, early 70s, and uh, probably even still today. The piece, Safa, was premiered on May 2nd, 1975 at the English Bach Festival. Uh, so Sylvia Gualda was given the score about a month beforehand, uh, which is crazy when you look at the score. And, and just for kicks, I'm going to go ahead and show you what that score looks like. It is a big breath on a very big piece of music. Actually, it was about a quarter of this size. It was written on one millimeter graph paper. Um, so a month to learn this very big setup and this really intricate new notation. Um, and so he wasn't completely satisfied, even though he was asked to come back and reprise the work uh, in the same concert. He ultimately went back and spent three months reworking out the piece. And ultimately he recorded that in 1978. Piece is uh, 15 minutes long, features about 16 instruments um, from the skin, which are drum instruments, wood, and the metallic sounds. And I'll discuss a little more about why I chose what you see on stage. I mentioned the recording by Silvio Gualda. I happen to have a copy of that here. Had to order this from Germany while I was studying. Um, Silvio Gualda recorded several other pieces. And this particular one, this recording, since it was the first, most people based their interpretations of the work off of this recording. Even though it's now out of print, whether or not people know this particular recording, most, um, most interpretations of the work kind of echo this. There was another person, um, another performer, Gert Mortensen from Denmark, recorded a few years later. Uh, his is definitely benefiting from hearing Walda's interpretation in terms of instrument choice, but also in terms of the accuracy of the score, the print score. Um, Steven Schick is a name uh, for those percussionists in the audience that you want to know. He is probably the foremost multiple percussionist in the world, uh, has been for about the last 20 years. He's commissioned about 100 different pieces. He saw a premiere of Safa, um, the New York American premiere at Carnegie Hall by a uh, percussionist by the name of Donald Knack. And that inspired him in the early 70s, or actually I guess it was about uh, as close to 1980 when it was premiered in New York. Um, and that inspired him to learn a version of the work that's a little bit different than how Sylvia Gualda does it. The reason I mention these different uh, versions are Zanakis' score leaves some freedom that I'm going to talk a little bit more about as well in terms of what instruments you can choose. It isn't a set, you have to play a marimba here, you have to play a set of bells here or something like that. It's a little bit more open-ended. Finally, I uh, wanted to turn your attention to a recording by Roland Auze, who was a, really mentored by Zanakis, and he has the only published version of Safa on a video recording, which is cool because it um, ties in the uh, multiple camera angles and you really get a good sense of where the important parts to look in the piece are. Briefly to speak about sort of scholarship surrounding this piece, um, it is widely recognized as the pivotal work in 20th century percussion solo writing. Uh, there were a few that came before, maybe four or five notable pieces. Uh, Zeitklus by Karlheinz Stockhausen, uh, John Cage wrote a uh, piece as well, and uh, Morton Feldman wrote a piece called The King of Denmark. All very different, mostly dealing with this concept of sort of playing with these interesting timbres that p composers just hadn't played with before. Uh, percussion was sort of unexplored territory. So um, Safa came along and sort of blew the doors open in the sense that it was purely based on rhythm and it was Zanakis' approach to um, something he called inside time and outside time. So there's, there's inside time where you're actually hearing uh, a piece of music, let's say, and then what happens in that space when the music is off and he figured out that it takes about 10 seconds for you to forget the tempo of what you had before, before you, um, you know, it's all gone. So he was into psychoacoustics a little bit. Um, but the real interesting part about Safa was that it was loud, it was drummy uh, for percussionists. We wanted something that we could really sink our teeth into. Some of these other pieces were more um, just light, delicate shadings. And there's some of that in Safa but um, it's definitely a departure from what came and really influenced the pieces that came after it. 
Most of the scholarship surrounding the work, though, has nothing to do with the music itself. It has to do with instrument choice. And I'm going to talk briefly about um, what Zanakis wrote at the end of the score. He doesn't write a whole lot of indication in the score, but at the very, very last page, uh, he writes this that he calls the note explicative. Uh, on the left hand box there are five different ways you can interpret accents. One of which is just a standard greater velocity. Uh, one of them is increasing weight. One of them is um, adding another sound while you're playing it. And um, let's see, weight, intensity, And the fifth one is um, a combination of all these. There's one I'm forgetting, and it's in French, so that's going to pose a problem for me. I'm going to move on, though. <laughs> uh, suffice to say, there are five ways that you could interpret it, um, but performance practice over the years has really boiled it down to just one way, and it's just with greater intensity, and it's, um, that's basically the agreed-upon method, uh, thanks to uh, another percussionist student of St uh, Steve Schick named Morris Palter. He boiled it down to just that first one. There are a couple places in the score where I will add an extra sound to sort of enhance the accent so you get a greater sense of that. Um, and I'll explain that when I get to it in the etudes. This next box has to do with the quality of the sounds. He wants the sounds to basically be in support of the architecture, he says. Um, basically, they should, uh, they, they should make you sort of be able to hear all the different aspects of what he's sort of almost creating like a sonic architecture in space, so that the very highest instruments should be much higher than the very lowest instruments. They should have a great range. And they should also be interesting sounds. He wants interesting not just like a snare drum or just a set of temple blocks. He particularly wanted rough sounds, and that's what this second box deals with. The third box uh, breaks down this breaks down the instruments in both register and type. So on the left hand side, you have numbers 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and letters A, B, C. Letter A, 1, 2, 3, are the highest. Uh, agu. I'm saying that terribly wrong, I'm sure. Um, but B is a medium, and C is the lowest pitches, and grave is the word he uses. Um, the lowest one at one point in the score, he just says, should, he does describe this, and he says it should be large, profound, flaccid. So something that rattles a lot, and so that's, that's what you're going to get on, uh, from a bass drum. It's always played on some kind of bass drum, almost always doubled with a bass drum pedal, and on my version, I'm only using the bass drum or the pedal. On the next box, uh, and also, sorry, uh, we have po and bois, which is skin and wood instruments. He lists a lot of drums, and so Understandably, a lot of people use a lot of drums when they play this. I've opted to use wood exclusively on the highest instruments and leave the wood to the lowest, th uh, lowest six instruments. The last box, these are metallic sounds. And he goes into great detail about what they should sound like. He, wants, he actually says like a railway tie, which if anybody has had an opportunity to hit a railway tie, it actually doesn't make a lot of sound. It makes a really high-pitched pinging sound. And, um, and it turns out when you play with wooden sticks on it, it doesn't work too well. Uh, you you break, break the sticks more than you get sound. Um, but these also have three different families. Um, the D group is a resonant. It says medium, but uh, the instruments he lists uh, are, are somewhat resonant. E should be what he calls neutral, so something that has a very almost uh, flat sound. And then the last three are very high pitched. Uh, he says trace IQ, which is very high. And for the, all the metals that I've chosen here, um, I've tried to keep them as, as far apart as possible, but definitely was more successful with the drums, because it's easier to get drums that are low pitched than it is metals that really sound good. And here's another version of the, the score to Safa. I just wanted you to take a minute and look at this. And it might remind you of math class, just a little bit. Uh, what is familiar to those who have studied music is accents over top the notes. That we understand. Uh, we see an F, which we can interpret to be forte, loud. Um, we see way up in the left corner um, a note to tell you to look at the last page, but also an indication of tempo. The piece is broken into five tempos, which so you have five kind of basic sections. I'm going to take and break it into 16, 
and here's why. There are several problems with this piece of music. Performances of Safa are very rare. Um, looking at the score, a lot of people you maybe get the idea, well, um, I want to read something that actually looks like traditional music that I've, I've read before. Um, and so a lot of people, just the, the score itself is a turnoff. Um, there are also very few methods available to learn how to play multiple percussions. So this is multiple percussion, the piece is written for that, but there aren't a whole lot of like guides. Like if you're a pianist, there are probably hundreds of method books out there to teach you how to play piano. For drummers, we have snare drum books, we have drum set books, we have marimba books. We have very few books that teach us how to play multiple percussion. The other problem, if you will, is that this piece, if broken down in this way as I've done, in the 16 smaller parts, each one of these can be used to isolate a different percussion technique. And thus, if you learn the whole piece, or if you learn each one of these, you can learn the piece. If you learn each one of these, you can also learn how to play multiple percussion as a whole. So my solution, what I hope to do, is to encourage widespread performance of the work. Um, first thing I did was change the notation. I wrote it in a form that you all see in your, in your handouts. On the left-hand side of that handout is the version that I came up with, and on the right-hand side is the same exact excerpt, but using Xenakis' score. The 16 parts that I've broken this into, I will call etudes, uh, because they are really like studies for um, a budding multiple percussionist. They each last about a minute long, and um, isolate one particular aspect of multiple percussion. They each uh, also have a kind of a set number of instruments. So you know in the first day two, you're only gonna have six instruments. Um, you don't have to suddenly grab other instruments to add to the setup. The other thing that I've done in this project is to identify and isolate impossible sections. Sections that just are so dense that when you first look at it, uh, especially on the score, it, it's hard to tell where the note comes next. Um, but also these have to be learned because of technically difficult. The other thing I found in studying this is that if you isolate those few places, you actually kind of unlock the rest of each etude and thereby unlock the rest of the piece. And as I mentioned, if you play this, developing the technique that you need to play Safa will help you as uh, a multiple percussionist and can be applied to other works. So a little bit about my method for notation. Um, I mentioned that they're each one minute. Um, I group the music, one of the things the score does not do is group anything in terms of any sort of phrasing. So you get uh, 10 beats at a time numbered with a number and it lasts, yeah, I think about 60 or 70 beats each line and it doesn't change. Even when the sections change, the, the, the phrases don't. You don't get any indication of where things start and end. So one thing I did was I broke the whole piece down into what seemed like really definitive moments and I put those on a line of their own and then you go on to the next line in the score and it's a lot easier to read that way as well. And you get a sense of some of the, um, the, the, the phrasing ideas that he was going for, if, you, if we can call it phrasing. I chose to use quarter notes for the notes that happen on the, uh, the Y intersect. Uh, so you have the X intersect is each instrument and they each have their own line, and then the Y axis is where that note hits in time, and we have beats in time as the other. Uh, is, we see that in the score. The notes that happen in between, these I've made to be eighth notes. And the reason for this was, first of all, if I went half notes and whole notes, they have an open note head, and Xenakis' score has closed note heads, and I want to kind of maintain that because it seemed a lot easier to read uh, from that standpoint. I also, quarter notes give you a uh, a stem, which if you have two notes happening across nine different lines, you can tell that those two notes are joined by the note stem. And likewise, the notes that are connected to, the, to each other across that staff are connected by uh, eighth note beams, and that is also makes that clearer to see. I simplified the dynamic indications. Um, at the very beginning we see an F, but in the, in the score that I showed you a second ago, the F actually is only for that lowest voice. And then you get F every time he wants something to be played forte on each individual line. And this becomes problematic because there's an awful lot of, of these dynamics that pop up all over the place. Um, more traditional notation isolates it and puts it at the bottom of the score, and so I chose to do that. There's usually a primary dynamic that's going on, 
and then there's kind of a secondary dynamic, meaning that one voice is going to play uh, a dynamic that's either louder or softer than, than the overall dynamic, and that I put in parentheses, and you'll see that when we get into the etudes. I also took into performance practice, uh, there's a couple places in the score where, for example, Zanakis writes an indication for all of the notes on these three drums to drop in pitch. And anybody who knows anything about percussion knows that there's really only one or two instruments that we have that can achieve this, timpani and rototoms. The problem with timpani and rototoms are is they have very thin heads. And if you'll see me playing, uh, and if, imagine timpani there, and there'd be a lot of broken heads. And that just doesn't work. And it's also not, Zanakis really didn't like the sound of timpani for this. He didn't want something that directly tied into the music of some kind of culture. Now, that to him, timpani was classical music, so he wanted to avoid that. So, I don't include that in the score at all. It's physically impossible to make a conga detune itself uh, in the middle of performance, not, not any way that I've come up with. Um, and if anybody knows of some way, I'd be all ears to hear how it can be done. Um, so that, that is out of the score. Um, and in other places, uh, there are a couple of places where the time slows down in literally every recording of the work. So I've added a retard, something like that. There are very few, but there are a couple of places where performance has um, has sort of solidified over the years, and I put that performance practice within the score. The main focus of my project, of course, is pedagogy, teaching. I want this to be taught. I want people to learn this. I, I hope my lecture um, and my performance, as, may, as well as the others that I've mentioned, will inspire some more people to play this, some of you maybe, um, to go ahead and learn this, especially if you're an undergraduate. It's very rarely played by undergraduate students, um, sometimes played by graduate students and really mostly played by the elite professionals. And I think, again, most of that comes down to the score is difficult um, and is off-putting. There's another reason I'm going to discuss in a few minutes as well. The etudes, I'm going to present them chronologically today, meaning I'm going to play through the piece basically as it occurs. Uh, I've got a short section from each one of these etudes and I'm going to play for you, talk a little bit about it. Um, but how I would actually teach it is in the following method, and this probably won't make as much sense as it will in a minute, but I, I named each etude by a letter, and there's a reason for that. First of all, Zanakis wrote another piece called Rebounds, and it has two movements, A and B. It doesn't matter which order you learn them in, you can play, play them A, B, B, A in performance, he said it's up to you. Um, and so I kind of like that, because I don't think you need to learn this piece from start to finish. Um, eventually you do if you're going to perform it, but as far as just as a tool for learning multiple percussion, you can actually go through and learn it in different orders. And so, um, the first one, A, doesn't show up until about the third uh, one that I teach because there's, a, there's a, a passage in it that's the hardest technical passage in the entire piece. Happens in the first 30 seconds. Which might be another reason why people just start looking at it and go, yeah, okay, this is, this is crazy, you put it aside. So, taking that into account, this is how I would teach it in this order. Just so you know that when I play, this isn't exactly how I would teach it. Also, as you go, you can group them into, once you've learned each one of them, you can group them into, uh, in a, in a group, large groups, these, these capital letters here on the left, that uh, reflect similar types of either instrumentation or techniques being applied. And then the piece is actually, interestingly, broken into two parts. And you'll see very clear demarcation of when that happens will be silence. These two parts are unequal. The first one's a little bit shorter than the second. Um, but again, Zanakis obviously had this idea of kind of uh, duality because it comes back in his second solo percussion piece, uh, Rebounds. So this is another way you can group what you've learned. It just kind of carries on uh, chronology. At this point, I'm going to sit down um, because this is how I'm going to play the piece and I'll be back and forth between the computer and speaking. Uh, and playing. Nobody else sits down when they play this. This is something I do. Uh, and there's a reason for that as well. Stephen Schick, the one I mentioned, uh, who had recorded this, is about the third person to uh, put out a major recording of this. He's performed the piece about five, six hundred times around the world. So he's pretty much an authority on it. But what he also has is uh, a bum left hip. His, his hip is completely shot because he stands up when he plays this and he's spent so much time practicing this work and performing it that he's worn out his left hip socket. So uh, I thought maybe I would avoid that. 
first etude uh, begin, introduces the sort of motor of the piece. And right off the bat, the pedagogical benefits are, for percussionists, this accent and tap relationship that we all study if we start on snare drum or we learn snare drum younger in life. Um, and it's this control over loud sounds and soft sounds. And that dexterity, that flexibility is what gives us control over our instrument. And it, it happens right off the bat. Uh, also, you have to negotiate up and up strokes and down strokes and vertical strokes and you have to get your spacing right. Um, it's a total of six instruments and the first passage I'm going to play is just this motoristic rhythm. This is sort of the, um, the underlying pulse of the entire work. Each one of these quarter notes equals one dot on the score. last slide that it incorporates both the skin and the wood voices. In my version I've chosen to use uh, three wood slats for the A, the highest uh, wood or skin category. I also chose to use three slats as opposed to three wood blocks because uh, I found that wood blocks break very easily in performance. Try to avoid that as well. Um, but also uh, Silvio Guala, the first to perform this, actually used two bongos and a wood block, and that's probably how it's most commonly done. Steven Schick uses this configuration. Nearly everybody who performs the work, though, it's important to note, uses a set of congas for this, these three instruments. This uh, next etude, still actually still the same etude, but example number two, uh, features two types of motion. The, the underlying motor rhythm uh, that we had at the very beginning, but also this uh, double time theme that's going to happen over it. And the important part is to really emphasize the accents and the control between accents and the taps, uh, which are grace notes. There are a couple of asterisks there, and there's a note at the bottom of the page which you don't have, and that note is that there is a place where there are three notes that occur at the same time in each of those instances. And I had to make a decision what to do there, because I've also chosen to use only two sticks. Some people will perform this using three, and it sounds a little bit like this. And I chose to do it with two to prove that you don't need to know four, four mallet technique or two sticks in each hand to do this. Uh, you can actually do this with, with one stick in each hand. These grace notes that you see are unaccented, so that's why they're written as grace notes leading to the principal note. This also allows you to hear both notes when they're struck together, as opposed to where all you hear is the accented note. When three notes occur, I have to get a little creative here. Still, the primary note is accented, whereas the grace notes can either occur before or after the accented pitch. In the original score, these all happen at the same time. So from that standpoint, that's a little bit easier to get. But again, this captures the sonic experience, the actual aural experience of hearing the work. And Sylvie Gualda, on his recording, the first one, uh, very clearly makes a difference. We call these, by the way, flams, just so for those of you who aren't in the know. Here's how it sounds with two sticks. Moving on to the second example, this is Etude B. It's continued development of these skills, the accents and the, and the grace notes. Uh, also balancing between two hands, it's almost an uh, uh, independent line and a, and a supporting line happening in the left hand while the independent line is in your right. Um, as the second Etude progresses, there are new combinations of accents and unison pitches. And there's also sort of a deconstruction process going on where the, uh, where there are less accents and less notes in the B voice and the A is sort of beginning to kind of nudge its way into being the primary voice throughout. This is uh, Etude B, example number three. Etude C, continued development of the skills from Etudes A and B, but it's simplifying. We're now going to have rests in between the phrases. Uh, there's going to be more space. But from a pedagogical perspective, it's mostly the same. There's also new permutations of what instruments are happening together. 
um, and the rests are going to sort of uh, foreshadow what's going to happen at the very middle of the piece. There's this growing importance of silence. And again, as I mentioned, that silence is important because he's sort of beginning to take the idea of time away. A2D is a complete reversal of the roles from the beginning where we have a primary voice here and a secondary voice up here. It switches. Uh, the right hand is going to be carrying on for the most part or what was the right hand. I'll be using both sticks. And just very sporadic um, punctuations from the B group of instruments. There is constant shifting of the accent placement throughout this etude, uh, even though material returns throughout. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and play. It's mostly, oh yeah, from the last phrase that I just played, um, this etude D is actually based on that last theme that you heard. And it's just cut and pasted and put in different um, versions. It's put in retrograde and reverse. And um, anyhow, this is how this sounds. This is example number five. A2D, example number six. Pedagogical benefits are that we are now going to incorporate our foot on the lowest bass drum. Um, we've had six instruments up to this point, now we have a seventh. You have to balance your right hand or your right foot with your two hands. Um, this continued development of this eighth note pulse that's happening, but in the lowest voices, in the B and the C group, it's all going to be in half time from the opening passage. Example number six. A to F, the pedagogical benefits are that we're adding two more instruments. We now have a total of nine instruments, all of the wood and skin group. Um, are going to be on display. And this is also what distinguishes the first half of Safa from the second half of Safa. There's frequent shifting between uh, quarter notes and eighth notes and he uses the entire staff. Uh, there's no sort of segmenting of the instruments into their own. It's constant motion throughout. This last passage, this passage you see on the screen is the last passage of Etude F and is by far one of the most dense passages in the entire piece. A2G, this is the final A2 to the first half. Um, he gets rid of that motoristic rhythm that we felt. The rests begin to be much more prominent. And at this point, uh, we have uh, a canon. We have a three-part canon between the upper group of instruments, the middle group of instruments, and the lowest group of instruments. A canon, for those of you who uh, don't know that term exclusively, it's when you sang, row, row, row your boat, and then somebody else starts it at a different point, and then they're interacting with each other. It still sounds good. Uh, in this case, the canon is uh, that not in terms of uh, notes, they're not doing counterpoint, they're doing the exact same melody. As a matter of fact, from the very beginning of the piece is where this comes from. Each of them plays the first 46 beats of the piece, and they just do it at different speeds, so that the lowest group that you can hear first is doing it at five and a half pulses or beats. The B group of instruments is going to be at three and a half pulses, is the cycle between beats. And then the A group is going to be at two and a half. So we have three different speeds going on and rests in between each one of the attacks. So what we're going to get is these, this very pointed sounding uh, disjunct rhythmically. Uh, hopefully you can still feel an underlying pulse under here. He does change it. This uh, basically doubles the tempo 
going from quarter note equals 152 to quarter note equals 272. This is example 8A. A to H. I'm not going to play this um, because you'll see for reasons that are pretty obvious, it's not hard to play. It's not technically difficult. It's a series of attacks and rests. And that's all I'm going to say. Got to save a little surprise for the end. A to I. We are now going to introduce the metal instruments. Um, the lowest, uh, not the lowest, but the uh, group E and D. Um, and uh, now we're going to have, basically, this is sort of the, the, the characteristic part of Safa that happens throughout the entire second half, which is these 11 instruments. Uh, you'll notice now the staff has gotten quite a bit bigger. If you're used to reading piano or, or percussion notation, we're used to reading about two of those staffs. We've now added the bass drum in the middle, and the metals now have their own. It's almost like reading a miniature score, and, um, which is what really does make it unique. This is etude. I example 9A. Continuing with the same wood skin and metal that we had from the last is A2J. A2J is the most uh, regular sounding of the pieces of the parts of Safa in the sense that it really does sound like counterpoint. It could almost be a fugue. Um, what's happening is basically we, in the left hand we have sort of the primary motion, the double time, and in the right hand we have on most of the woods and skins, we're going to have the, uh, the, the motoristic quarter note rhythm. Uh, you've got to, in, now that we've added the metals, you have to continue and develop balance and touch. Hitting a metallic instrument versus hitting a wood or skin instrument is extremely different. Um, and that's one of the other benefits of this is while other pieces uh, in the multiple percussion literature have uh, interesting sounding metallic objects, they're not as difficult to uh, balance. These are very loud. You can't hit them too hard or it overpowers. At this point, oh yes, there's also an overlap. So there's actually sort of thematic material that's happening in here. And Zanakis has sort of layered them so that when one sort of phrase or thematic idea ends, the other one is still playing out its. So that there's actually uh, this crossing over, this dovetailing of the phrases, which also makes it very difficult to keep your place uh, where you are at any given time. This is example 10A from Safa A2J. continue on like that. Uh, like H, I'm not going to play K. It's a reversal. Uh, it's a very short etude. It's a reversal of these rolls. The woods and skins will take over that constant eighth note and the left hand or the metallics will take over the um, secondary theme, the slower theme. Etude L. We're going to go back to what we saw a few slides ago um, where we have this interplay between the uh, metals and the woods and skins. And now Zanakis is employing this idea very pointedly of uh, what he calls repeated notes. And that's what you can see the very first uh, under 1690. Uh, these repeated notes are just a theme that he's continued to develop throughout the end. And eventually these will also begin to dovetail with other instruments to what he calls ensembles of timbre. And we'll get to that in a second. But um, still have to develop your touch and timing around the instruments because you've got a long distance to go. In the score, you get a real quick view that we have the bass drum C3 going up to the high woods. Um, that relationship is always difficult to see in the score, and the eighth note um, beam does a, works wonders for that. Here's example 11A, A2 to L. <laughs> 
A2M. Pedagogical benefits of this are that you're playing these alternated strokes. Uh, this is what, if you march in a drum line, uh, we, we would call uh, rebound strokes. Can't rebound a whole lot off anything, the woods and metals, but the skins work pretty well for this. This is a, a good way to get your hands uh, playing full strokes. But um, also, um, you need to develop this touch and balance, as I said before. But there's also this new idea nestled in the middle of this called the iambic foot. So iambic rhythm, as I mentioned at the beginning, is this short followed by long. At six, uh, 1751, there's a quarter note followed by a quarter note with an accent. And there's, this has happened, we've heard this already, but this is going to take on even more significance and balancing out the sound of piano, which we now get a soft dynamic, with the louder dynamics in the iambic foot and the bass drum attacks. So here is Etude M, example number 12. I must have skipped a slide. Okay, now we get. Now we get what I was just mentioning. A to N. Here is Etude O. We've had a lot of these similar ideas grouped together um, being played throughout this. We had L, M, and N are very similar. A, B, C, and D are very similar. O stands apart. And I'm going to briefly touch on what we're looking at here. Xenakis wrote in the score that there was to be, he wrote these three slashes, which for percussionists indicate a tremolo or a roll. But he also wrote there should be two to three notes for each quarter note, or each eighth note rather. And at that tempo that he writes it, it's physically impossible. And this kind of impossibility pops up throughout Xenakis' writing. Pianists, um, there are some pieces that, he's that he wrote for notes that don't even occur on the instrument. Like, they don't exist, they're off. So, that he wrote it, something that was impossible is just sort of par for the course. So we have to figure out what to do in this. Silvio Gualda's version, he puts a second pair of bongos and a second woodblock and maybe even a, a couple of extra congos, and he <laughs> plays in between. That works out pretty well, except you have to have an entire second set of instruments to carry around, which presents logistical and space challenges when you're uh, learning the piece. Uh, Stephen Schick, his solution was to play single stroke rolls on the different instruments. What this does for you is uh, you get the sense of each of these attacks being that two to three in the amount of time that he asked for, but you get the two instruments that he, that he calls for. That's the solution that I've gone with for today, uh, and I'm going to play this example number 14A from A2 to O. And finally, A2P. This is the, one of the few times where Zanakis calls for the percussionist to use both sticks very rapidly. Uh, he doesn't indicate this, but the stems or the beams going up indicates a left-right combination, and beams coming or the, yeah, the beams coming down uh, a right-left combination. These are all very rapid um, eighth note, right and left. We call them alternated or a single-stroke roll. There's some doubling in this, and that's also very helpful. Which is why. Uh, at the beginning when I said the order I would play these are different, um, O occurs, I, I would teach that almost at the very beginning. O also features, uh, sorry, P also features um, steady quarter notes on the bass drum, sort of hearkening back to the opening passage. Uh, and at the very beginning of P, which I'm, you're not going to see when I play this example, but you will hear in the piece, there are accents 
that I'll double on these drums here. Here's A2P, example number 15A. Before I perform the piece, I'm just going to summarize what I've spoken already. Uh, soft is important work and deserves to be played by more, and I believe, younger percussionists. Um, I encourage any undergraduates who uh, like a challenge, take a look at it. Even if you don't learn the entire work, there's some really important material in here, and it affects what happened later. Um, pieces like Rebounds, pieces like 13 Drums by Maki Ishii, um, and others. Also, um, if learned in this stepwise and progressive way, Safa's useful method for understanding how to approach all of multiple percussion. Um, and this is a good example of learning technique through repertoire. Um, and hopefully, it's in a way that we can all, uh, if, you, if you've studied classical, western, traditional notation, that you'll be able to pick it up really quickly. So at this time, I'm going to step off stage and um, allow my friend to turn on the, uh, mic the uh, camera here. I'm going to show it show a uh, view over my shoulder, um, and we'll begin the second half. <laughs>